Well, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. And um, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath. And we are grateful for uh, the way that you work in our lives, for the rest that you give us in Christ, for the promises of your word, uh, for the messages uh, that come from your word, that change us, and that we are to share with others. We just ask for your Holy Spirit this afternoon as we open your word together, as we look at the issues around us, and as we try to um, find sure footing for our feet upon this path that we are walking towards the eternal city. And we just ask, Lord, that you can be with each person in their personal struggles and help each mind to understand these things. Help me to present them clearly and guide and direct in the things we study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good afternoon again. Um, so the study today is is supposed to be a wrap up of this study on um, twenty thirty, the Great Reset. Now, what you see in front of you, of course, is Revelation chapter fourteen, and we know that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develop and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And the one class we know that vindicates Christ's character that's going to go through the time of trouble is the 144,000. Of course, we're all familiar with Revelation 4, 4, uh, 14 and Revelation 7, where the 144,000 are presented. And... I'm just going to read some of this here. We're going to comment on it. There's other things that I'm going to look at, but I haven't really dealt with this too much in the context of this study. So we've looked a lot at, because we did a, a study before this, dealing with Revelation 12, 13, and 17 um, on the presidents of the United States, and then we've been doing this study that relates to uh, the dragon power, particularly in our time, the global, globalism, which... Uh, uh, the World Economic Forum uh, uh, pretends to represent to some degree. It doesn't represent all of it because uh, the dragon power is quite divided um, and it tends to be more a destructive power rather than um, a power that's unified. Anyway, I, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, on the Mount Zion, and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard, heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now White says, you know, that we need, uh, need to seek to be among the 144,000, something to that effect. I mean, I might not be quoting what she says word for word. But this is a goal for, the, for us, for this movement. That is, we want to be of the class that is the wise, the five wise, not the five foolish. And we um, are seeking to vindicate God's character, something which the church looks down upon. The idea of what they call last generation theology is... Uh, pretty much vilified within Adventism. We have some leaders who um, uh, give at least um, uh, 
uh, verbal support for last generation theology, such as Ted Wilson, though whether their understanding of it is complete or not, that would be another question. Um, so we know that this is not talking literally. When it says that they are not defiled with women for they are virgins, what would this be referring to? I think it's referring back to Ezra 10, where they were told to put away the strange wives, the doctrines, or anything false for that matter. Well, yeah, so, but these, uh, um, they're not defiled with women. A woman would be a church, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Stephen put up the quote there. It says, let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. That's from Review and Herald, March 9th, 1905. Um, so they're not defiled with women, with the doctrines of the various churches. And they are virgins. So that means they have a pure doctrine, a pure religion. Now they follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. What would this be a reference to? Why is why is it talking about the lamb and following him whithersoever he goeth? From the holy place. Following the Christ. Place. Okay, Stephen. Right. Stephen first. Like in the time of 1844, they followed Christ from the holy place unto the most holy place. Right. And, and this is referencing us back uh, to Revelation chapter 5, this lamb that was slain that had seven horns and seven eyes, right? Correct? This is, this is the lamb there. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so we can see that this lamb is also unsealing messages. And those messages are progressive messages, and they do address uh, the imagery that's presented in the sanctuary, right? Because the book of Revelation is full of this sanctuary imagery, and this is the work that Christ is doing in redeeming mankind. So they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, these who are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, this idea of the 144,000 being first fruits, what's the significance of that? It was to be with Christ without seeing death. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Sort of, uh, yeah, the first, the first group that would promise the harvest to come, a sample of the harvest to come. Okay, so we know that Christ is the first fruits as well, but Christ died and was resurrected. Hey, um, brother, Lord, didn't uh, Christ take some to him with him to heaven when he died, when he rose? Yeah. And went to heaven. He took a group with him. He called them the first fruits, didn't he? Yeah, so those are the first fruits of them that slept. Yeah. Right? But these first fruits, are they resurrected? No. No. So they, so no, they don't no. taste death. No. Yeah. So there, there's um, this group that is is also called first fruits, but it is not not a group that was resurrected from the dead, such as Christ is the first fruits, but also those that he took with him to heaven, one representative from each generation. But also we have the 144,000 being first fruits. So it's a, it's, it is a first fruits. It's just a different symbol. Those that have died and are resurrected and those that are translated without seeing death. And, and so these are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, which of course um, is, is obviously speaking more metaphorically, not literally. Um, um, it says here, uh, I can't remember which verse. Yeah, so it's 
It's a lot, lot of, lot of stuff here, but it says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we can see here that a man can't raise himself from the dead. And and this, this whole idea that we're heavenly in heavenly places in Christ Jesus is a type of resurrection. Even if we are still alive, we're raised from our spiritual death, being sinners. And this, this being born again could be paralleled to the idea of being resurrected. So we're raised up together and we sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the 144,000 are with Christ. They're following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Through a study of the scriptures and through the experiences that they pass through that are fulfillments of prophecy. Now, we looked at a bit at this last night in, in studying, which I'm not going to go into the chronology of it again, but when we looked at the story of Ezra, chapter 7 to 10, it begins on the first day of the first month in 457 and ends on the first day of the first month in 456 BC. And the days, the number of days in that year are um, 354 days. And we had done studies on this before, so there's other places that I've, I've presented this. But we can see that it's going to begin at 9-11 and end in 2030. And there's uh, three different ways in which we counted that. Literal months, 2,300 months that count from uh, the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030 show that we have this structure of the 2,300 months, which is 186 years. But then also in Ezra itself, when we start on 2030 and we do a day for a month, um, it's going to bring us back to um, September 11th. And what we can see is that there's this connection between September 11th and this future date, which we're not predicting anything on. It may just be a symbolic date. We don't know because we can't predict events. But what we can see is that September 11th is connected with Islam. And if we're going to look at a symbolic representation of what April 5th, 2030 would be about, it would, it would be that this message is preparing uh, a people and a message, right? So everything we're going through, this movement, is about a message and a people who are going to present uh, a message to the Levites, to Seventh-day Adventists, to prepare them for the Sunday Law. And that's going to happen progressively through a thing called the Midnight and the Midnight Cry. And if I was going to um, put something at 2030, I would say that it would have, have to be something connected with giving a message, the message being empowered in some way, that it can be given to the Levites. But we still have lots of history to pass through, and whether that date ever comes about or not, I don't know. But we can at least see symbolically it's all connected to 9-11, uh, to the July 18, 2020 prediction, to our history, to Collins' um, study, to Adilio's study. All of these different symbols have all come together to show that 2030 is at least symbolically significant. And, but the purpose here is to prepare a people. Now, often when we do these types of studies, we study about... Uh, you know, what, what's happening in prophecy, we often foc focus upon the negative things, that is, what the globalists are doing, what the Protestants are doing, what the Catholic Church is doing. But those things only have meaning in that they are prophecies that as they come to pass, help us to understand where we are in this work of following Christ. 
And what tends to happen with human nature is we can focus upon all of these external events and not actually do the work that we need to do in preparing to give a message. That is, the me it can be quite sensational. People are interested in it. You know, one of the things I notice about social media um, is, well, you know, when I was younger and studying Adventism, you're, when you, the material that we had was pretty much published material. You didn't get a lot of wacky material. It wasn't usually um, readily available. I, I do know that the, um, the Alberta uh, Adventist Book Center, they had uh, a guy who was a manager, and he would bring in some of this more um, not mainstream sort of material. And some of it was good, but some of it was pretty wacky. And um, when I was first an Adventist, I was probably been, been an Adventist for about two years, no, probably even three years, um, there were some friends who had, um, it was like uh, a newspaper, that's how it was published, so in like uh, a tabloid form. Uh, it was about the 1987 Jubilee. And so, you know, you weren't usually used to seeing that kind of stuff. Nowadays, you can find all kinds of things, all kinds of interpretations of prophecy, different views but back then it was one of the first things I was really exposed to that was sort of a comprehensive uh, view on prophecy that definitely was not uh, not sound um, so they were looking for Christ to return in 1987 and there was actually a few people I knew who were caught up in this who believed that Jesus was coming in 1987 so this was would have been about 1985 um, and uh, When we, when we look at these types of things, there's this sensational aspect, but there isn't a redeeming aspect to it. And if, if our message is true, if it's from God, it should, it should have a redeeming quality. Now, how, what do I mean by that? How would we characterize something that has a redeeming quality um, from something that doesn't. It Is, brings you closer to God. Okay, so it brings you closer to God. Well, what does that mean particularly? It doesn't focus on the world. It focuses on your relationship with God. Okay. Now, we have all kinds of things as Adventists, you know, prophecies. So if we're studying the 2300 days, or the 70 weeks, or the 1335, or we're studying Millerite history, or studying Revelation 12, 13, and 17. How can we how can we distinguish a an interpretation of scripture that is true, that has redeeming qualities? And, and, and I want something more concrete. I mean, I understand I agree with Heidi. Um, but how would this manifest itself? If something has a redeeming quality or something doesn't? Well, most time it burns within your heart, don't it? Okay, but those are those are rather subjective things. I mean, anybody can say whatever they're studying is bringing them conviction. It burns within their heart. It, how can we tell this more objectively? There should be some alignment with scripture, like a principle, even. Okay, so there are some principles that are going to align with scripture. So one is, whatever we believe, we know that it's going to be consistent with scripture. Uh, when people have sensational ideas, they may pick up on some point, they bring it to some kind of extreme, and the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, uh, it, in the areas that it contradicts their views, will often be disregarded. Yeah. Right. So that's one thing. And I've seen this many, many times. You can see this with feast keepers, um, uh, with people who believe in uh, lunar various Sabbath. lunar Sabbath, various views on uh, on the Trinity. Um, there's all kinds of different views out there, different winds of doctrine. Um, 
you know, even people that God does not kill. And they're going to have some way in which they use the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, but in other places where they will say, Ellen White didn't have light on this area. Um, so they will say, well, we have new light. But Ellen White says new light never contradicts old light. It only makes it shine brighter. So, so that's one way we can tell. Now, what are some other ways um, that we can tell, especially in ourselves, that um, there should be warning signs to ourselves regarding uh, what it is where we believe or study that it's, it's just merely sensational? Um, how are we going to see those who disagree with us, for instance? How are we going to treat them? And, and what principle is being exercised here? Well, we should be patient. Okay, so so patient. So if we're dealing, if we believe we have the truth, look, we actually believe it. Um, we will trust that God is in control of the truth. And we don't need to control others, right? We would, we would let the truth do its work. But if we don't have the truth, then we're going to need to use civil power uh, to help enforce the truth, what we consider to be the truth, correct? has been done yeah so if I believe I have the truth the truth can bear investigation and actually I would welcome people who have differing views obviously if somebody's abusive and cruel and all those types of things I, I may not want to have anything to do with them but if somebody truly holds a different view that person we would hear and we would give uh, that person an opportunity to be heard by others. Does that seem correct, what I'm saying? I mean, because sometimes we have the, the view expressed, well, somebody's teaching error, and so we need to shut him down because other people might hear what he has to say. And what would be the problem with that idea? Someone else might also have preconceived ideas that they're trying to work through, so it's best to hear people out so you can learn. Okay, so if that person has, has sympathizers, if we treat them unfairly, uh, we could actually make the situ situation worse. That's one thing. I think that's kind of what you're saying, right? Kind of, yeah. But, yeah, you have that situation with Lucifer. Mm -hmm. God bore with him quite long time. Yeah. He didn't yeah. just uh, chastise him or destroy him immediately. Yeah. He let things progress that people could then weigh up what yeah. was the right thing to do. And Satan, in a sense, is the one who made the call to war, in my reading of it because it now became open rebellion to God's government at a certain point. Correct? Yes. So, because um, people can often, often sincerely believe wrong things, and, and even things that can be quite dangerous, but we need to be redemptive in how we deal with others. So if we are actuated by the Spirit of Christ, we will act in the way that Christ acted. Now, um, right now this world is moving towards a crisis. And, and one of the things we see is that, you know, we had this pandemic and we had um, uh, these mandates. We had force, the state using force to compel people to do what the state believed was right. And of course, we would not agree with that. Now, 
in how do we respond to that as a Christian to this type of oppression, if we want to call it oppression, this type of control by the state? What is our responsibility? Well, providing that the, it doesn't get in our way between God mm -hmm. or worship of God, that we can uh, obey the laws of the land. Okay, so there's certain certain ways in which we would obey the laws of the land. You know, for instance, as much as a mask is a useless thing to protect you from the coronavirus. Um, at work, when I was teaching guitar, I had to wear a mask. Of course, it, you know, it was very loose fitting. I could easily breathe. Um, it wasn't really functional as a mask. I didn't wear the medical one, so just it was a very thin cloth mask and very loose fitting. But um, out of respect for my son who owned the guitar store and out of respect of the laws of the land, I would have to conform to that. Now, some people would protest. They would, uh, that is, that's the hill that they would die on. Um, and why, and so Stephen, since you, 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 I think you, you're on the right track here. How would you, how would you define where we conform and where we don't conform? You already kind of stated it, but, um, Sometimes it's not as clear cut as some people might make it out to be. So why would we conform, let's say, something like wearing a mask? Uh, why would we not die on that hill? At least I would not. Well, there's a lot of people who would be caught up in what's the, the what we could maybe say, propaganda of okay. the need to wear a mask or whatever and yeah. they're fearful. So it's out of love for them that we would uh, wear a mask because they might be uh, freaked out, whatever. Yeah. To see someone, you know, so it wouldn't be, it maybe expresses of love to them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there is a respect just to others. I mean, those people are not our enemies. And um, so... If somebody wants me to wear a mask, I can wear a mask. It's not going to hurt me. It, it's not going to kill me. Well, uh, Theodore, yeah. I got a, a Revel, um, the Vic is 13, 40, 44, and 45. And he is a leprosy man. He is unclean. The priest shall promote him. Utterly, pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague is in his head, and the leopard in whom the plague is, he clothes, his clothes shall be ripped, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. Yeah, so, so we can see, obviously, if there's an, an illness, there's some kind of plague, um, people would uh, cover themselves and make, and basically this is social distancing, um, you know, using your voice to tell people that you're unclean. Um, here it's talking about leprosy, and that's not the modern leprosy that we, that we have today. There Actually, it's a different illness, but anyway. Um, so we can see that God uh, takes this, um, which of course becomes a symbol of sin, but we can see that he has this, there is a time that we need to quarantine, there is a time that we need to uh, uh, protect others. Now of course we know in this case they were making healthy people wear masks that didn't protect them or protect anybody from them. But you know that's that's a whole other issue. But here, yeah, you can see that there is there is a place for this type of thing. And if somebody, out of respect for others, who is fearful, there would be nothing wrong with putting a covering on your on your mouth, your upper lip, and and keeping your distance from others. 
But you notice it didn't say over your nose. It just said your upper lip. Yeah, well, that's just Hebrew expression. Yeah, so whatever that means specifically, it's hard to say. But um, so anyway, the point is some people would look at the fact that the government's trying to force us as something that we need to protest. Now, why do we not protest um, this type of oppressive action of the state? Because, I mean, okay, Heidi? Because we're not political people and we're not to be politically involved. Okay, so we're not political. I uh, do protest, protest it by quoting from science and Knowing that when I wear a mask and I've told everybody when I had like if I had to go to the clinic or something, I tell people exactly the effect it has on me. Oh, yeah. And I rip it off just before I walk into the room where I'm going to be treated. And usually the person who's in charge agrees with me. And yeah. I say, I respect I'm, you have to keep your clinic open and you have to follow these rules. But the 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 receptionist last year was adamantly ordering people to come in wearing a mask. Now she kind of laughs, like came in the last time with a cotton hat. And I just said, this is my mask. I threw out all the rest of them. And she just laughed as I went down the hall and placed it against my, my face. Okay. So she's coming around. Okay. Well, I don't particularly agree with you on this one, but, um, but when I'm talking about protests, I'm not talking so much about with individuals here. Um, you know, when we talk about protest, I would mean political protest. Uh, some people have sent uh, petitions for us to sign. Um, and what what's the biblical principle why we would not be involved in this uh, politically? What's 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 in what's involved here? Because I know it's not as always clear cut as we would like it to be. Well, what would you say to A.T. Jones, though? Should, isn't there a time when we have to approach the powers that be damned? No, well, that's what I call them. I mean, okay. I've talked talk to politicians about this, and it's funny how they skirt around when you when you pin them down like Pierre Polyevra with Gates, for example. I said, how can I trust somebody who takes a photo with Bill Gates? He didn't answer that. He answered my other questions. Okay, so um, we're going to get into A.T. Jones here in a bit. Um, now, A.T. Jones, we know he spoke before a Senate, uh, a special Senate committee dealing with uh, um, the Chicago World's Fair, right, regarding a Sunday law, correct? Right. Does anybody know how A.T. Jones ended up being uh, speaking and and uh, before a Senate committee? Not to my knowledge. Yeah, I, I don't personally know. I've read read all of that history. I'm not quite sure how he ended up in that position. I don't know if he was invited, which is what I always have assumed that he was invited to speak. Um. I don't, I don't know of any, but somebody may correct me. Maybe the church took an action um, for him to, to be heard. I, I don't know that the church may have responded in some way. I have no idea. It could have been from uh, just people knowing people. I'm not sure how, how that came about. Now, has anybody here read uh, Joan's presentation that was made? Yes, I did. I've, I've read it too. Anyone else? Sort of, maybe bits of it. I don't know the whole thing. Okay, so, and yeah, so you've read bits. Okay, so I've read it. I mean, it was a long time ago that I read it, but I remember quite a bit about it and, and the types of arguments he made. So one of the things um, when we had in this movement, uh, people like uh, Tyler, and Tess um, presenting ideas that the United States is not a Christian nation. Uh, this would, and, and they were promoting Jones' books in support of this. 
Of course, people weren't really reading Jones' books. Um, they were just giving lip service to it. Because if you read what Jones wrote, he's quite clear that the United States is a Christian nation, that the Constitution is a Christian document. But in Christianity, we believe in religious freedom. That is, people, because God believes in religious freedom, God allows people to make choices. And he deals a lot with what he calls morality and civility, you know, um, uh, and the distinctions between the power of the state. Now, when we're dealing with something like these mandates, as much as they're, they're misguided scientifically, that is, they're not following the science, um, and they may be infringing upon certain types of freedoms that we have, they're not they're not affecting our religious freedom. Now, some people may argue that they are, um, especially when it comes to something like a vaccine mandate. So a mask is one thing, a vaccine is another thing. You could also um, yeah. say when they're sort of shutting down churches, that um, you're going away against the, what it says in Hebrews, no forsake, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. Yeah. So shutting down churches definitely uh, is a no-no. Um, now, of course, some churches could accommodate uh, certain types of rules. Um, and uh, But when they just say people can't meet at all, then that, that's something, I think, where they've overstepped their bounds. But um, the person would have to decide where you stood, where are, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue going to church, even when they tell you that your church shouldn't uh, be open? Now I know in Warburg the church was shut at times, but all of the church members they met together, various houses on Sabbath. They'd still have uh, people over for Sabbath dinner, um, so it wasn't. It didn't really make much sense because it didn't really stop. It actually made much more. Um, uh, close interaction that they wouldn't have had at church because people had it at home. People, of course, didn't stay in their homes. And uh, even when they weren't allowed to visit, uh, technically they still did. I mean, it's pretty hard out in the country to stop that type of stuff from happening. But um, there are times when we have to disobey the laws of the government because they're going to transgress our religious freedom. But what would that mean as far as politically? Would we go to the streets in protest? No, we wouldn't. Okay, because if we're following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, if we're following the character of Christ, we're not going to stand up for our rights. Did Christ stand up for his rights? No. He went to the cross. And I understand the, the, the feelings that we can have regarding things that are unjust. But Christ was treated unjustly, but he opened not his mouth. He didn't have his disciples uh, petition uh, the church or the government. He didn't send out, um, uh, you know, any kind of, he never, he, he didn't want his servants to fight. He says, he that takes up the sword shall perish by the sword. And we know, all know what it's like uh, to be controlled against our will and that feeling that it gives us. Um, I remember when I was a kid, the one thing I could not handle uh, was being tied up. And... Uh, you know, sometimes when kids are playing, they're going to tie you up. And, and if they were going to ever tie me up, I was going to fight pretty viciously not to be tied up. I didn't like that idea. It really scared me. I'm claustrophobic as well. But, um, you know, so we all know that feeling. You know, when these mandates came in, how we felt. But as Christians, uh, we know that that there is another principle that's controlling us. And when we look at something like Revelation 13, 
we know that there is these restrictions that are placed upon us, and these are religious restrictions. The receiving of the mark of the beast is the Sunday law, the seal of God that the 144,000 have, because they have their father's name written in their foreheads. They, they don't receive the mark of the beast. And it's not because they're protesting, they're making political uh, maneuvering to receive the seal of God. It's because they have the character of Christ and that they, they will, like Christ, um, yield up all of their rights for the good of others. So, I mean, there's lots that we could go into that um, in understanding what's happening. Now, when we look at, so I don't know how to do this part, so I'm, I'm going to jump over to something else. So I'm going to, I talked about it with some of the people before the study here. So I'm going to go to this. Now, Dwight had a document this morning uh, that had um, um, 45,600 words in it. And I, I just made a comment at the end about it. Now, that the 45,600 words happens to be the number of the tribe of Benjamin, um, in, uh, and this is in Numbers 26. Benjamin also has in Numbers uh, 2 um, 35,400 uh, men. And so this number to me was just interesting because I saw 45,600. I knew it was the number of the tribe of Benjamin. And I, I just made a comment about it. Now, we know today is August 13th. What's the significance of August 13th? Connects to Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Yeah. I mean, yeah I mean, and we know that Daniel Vanderhorst um, had noticed this date and found things connected to the structure of our movement. Right. So he had looked at August 13th, 2022, um, back in, well, I think it was before July. It was definitely before July 18th. I think it was like June or something of 2020. Um, so he did some presentations, which are on my YouTube page. And, and then later he looked at August 13th, 2021. Um, but originally when he had August 13th, 2022, it was like, well, that's too far in the future. I mean, our line ends December 25th, 2021. Um, so I looked at the date as merely a symbolic date. That is, I didn't think that we could predict anything um, in 2022. So, so we know today is August 13th, 2022. And um, so when I saw this number, and we've been using these numbers as spans of time, uh, what I did is I... Yeah, let me see if I can do this. So using the, the calendar converter, we have um, that. And I go to here. So I'm going to share this screen. Just hang on a sec. There we go. Oh, oh there it is. Yeah. Okay, so you, what you see here is the calendar converter. I have a lot of dates here. These aren't the ones I want. Uh, let's try this. No, it's not doing what I want. Sometimes I dislike computers. Okay. So. Okay, there it's doing what I wanted. Ah. Now, so you can see here the date I have. 
on the bottom, August 13th, 2022. And you can see that 45,600 days before that is October 7th, 1897. Now, October 27th, 1897 is, is rather interesting. Um, so that's not the one I want here. Click on this. So when I go up here, you can see the characteristics of this date. So the first thing you'll see is it's the seventh day of the 10th month. But on the biblical calendar, it's the 10th day of the seventh month. It's an inversion. Now, where did we first see this type of inversion? of dates. Yeah, we've seen it uh, with the, the temple. Was it the second temple being dedicated? Yeah, the dedication of the second temple, temple, where it's dedicated on the third day of the 12th month in 515 BC, which happens to be the 12th day of the third month on the Julian calendar. So it's going to be uh, March 12th. And it's not something that happens very often with, with dates, um, that you're going to have these inversions like this. So I thought it was rather interesting that when I, I counted back from today's date, using the number of the tribe of Benjamin, I came up with a symbol um, that would be uh, a symbol of October 22nd, 1844, the 10th day of the 7th month, the Day of Atonement. And... Um, and then uh, I also used another number from Benjamin, the 54,400, and I counted back there, and it gave me September 11th, 1925. So it gives me another symbol uh, that relates to, in this case, 9-11. And it's interesting that the biblical date here is the 22nd day of the sixth month. So that's a number that relates to uh, FFA. All right, so rather interesting there that we have, uh, in both cases, these symbolic dates. Now, of course, in, in these dates, we don't have any major events occurring. But on the 10th day of the seventh month in 1897, um, there are some articles that are published. Uh, there's one in the Signs of the Times. There's one in... Um, uh, the Youth Instructor, both of these by Ellen White. And then there's another one in the American Set Sentinel. It's an editorial um, by A.T. Jones. And, and that one I want to look at. <coughs> I don't really like them having this uh, black background with white text, but you, you have to put up with this. Um, now this, you can see it's October 7th, 1897. And he's going to talk about the best way to restore Sabbath observance. Uh, a good example will accomplish more in this direction than law or precept. And and A.T. Jones is an interesting writer. He's, he's in some ways quite repetitive. He uses lots of increased and enlarged um, principles. And he, he likes to say things in a in a way that's a little bit startling, that makes you look at something a little more uh, deeply than you would have. So he said, so I'm just going to read some of this. Um, the Sabbath is the Lord, of the Lord is a gift. The man-made Sabbath is an institution thrust upon the people by the force of civil pains and penalties. So we can see that how God gives us the Sabbath, it, it's a gift. It's not something thrust upon us by the force of civil pains and penalties. Now, somebody uh, reading this who knows the story of, of the Exodus would say, well, no, the, the Sabbath was a thrust upon the people by force of civil pains and penalties um, in, in the time of Moses. And how would you answer that? What's happening in the time of Moses? That the gift was restored. Okay, the gift was restored. But why is there going to be force used? I mean, the people who go out and gather sticks on the Sabbath are going to be stoned to death. Um, so what's, what's going on here? Because the adversary does not want 
the gift to be accepted. Okay, well, but we, we see that there appears to be force by God uh, for those that don't keep the Sabbath. Well, the people had agreed that they would, what the Lord said that they would do. Okay, so they actually went in, in, into covenant with God under a theocracy. So they had accepted that this theocracy, this covenant. And so in that covenant, they said that all the Lord had said, we will do and be obedient. Now, of course, we know um, there is a progression of events that happened. Uh, so when we look at the covenant, it's going to be in uh, Exodus chapter. 19 correct I think that was the chapter well you have the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 yeah so you're gonna have the Ten Commandments now when the people gather sticks on the Sabbath is that before or after that's numbers okay so yes yeah. okay well so so this is going to be, um, yeah, so it's going to be after, right? So they're going to have, have made this covenant. And so it's going to be after they made this covenant, not before. So God isn't forcing them to enter into covenant with him. Correct? Yes. Now, of course, we know that they're under a theocracy. And under a theocracy, were they able to keep that covenant? They didn't. No. So, and, and, and often when you have the skeptic that talks about, well, if God is real, why doesn't he, you know, show himself? And why doesn't he, you know, make it much clearer that he's God so that we can obey him? He's already done that, and, and that wasn't very successful in bringing about uh, the character of Christ. So even though God goes into this covenant with man, it's not his ultimate purpose to have um, this type of theocracy that existed with this, these intermediaries between God and man. He wants to have Christ to be this intermediary, and all of these things point to Christ. So God wants to restore us uh, into his image so that we can have that relationship that, we, that Adam had before the fall. And so, so somebody who just reading on the surface wouldn't quite understand what Jones is talking about here. Um, he says, there are always plenty of men in the world who are willing to become lawmakers for other people and by their zeal in this to atone for their own shortcomings. This is a very insightful statement and reminds me of the statement of um, C.S. Lewis about the busybodies who are worse than the robber barons because um, they're trying to do something for their own, uh, you know, they're trying to force morality upon others. But this idea here that they're trying to atone for their own shortcomings. Um, have we have we ever experienced this personally, either in the church or this movement? Have we ever even done this ourselves? As humans, it's likely. Yeah, so Iran has a quote there, Dean, these people excluded from Canaan. So this is going to be because it's not simply just they went out to gather sticks. It's actually a rebellion against God. Um, so good quote there. Um, people can look at that if they want. But this idea that people are trying to control others to atone for their own shortcomings. Have, have you ever thought about this? why people try to control others. 
I mean, this is another way, I guess, of saying he that condemns another man does the same things. What, what is the principle at, at work here? Why does this occur? A counselor told me once, and I agree with her, she said the people that realize even at, uh, subconsciously that they cannot control themselves are the ones most forceful in trying to control others. Yes. I was married to somebody like that. He was an absolute psychopath. Yeah. Consequently, I'm no longer married. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we know that um, there's there's a principle of human nature at work here. So what what is the principle? If you can call a, a principle of human nature a principle. We don't tend to follow God. We want to be in control. Okay. Um, because we all know that we're sinners deep down inside, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Well, it's easier pointing your finger at someone else and dealing with your own issues. Yeah. What's the principle? The principle would be light and darkness, right? Right. So if we think about the truth, um, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That darkness is manifested in what way? What is darkness? I mean, we know it's not light, it's error, but what is it? Essentially sin, what removes us from God. Okay, men love darkness because they're sinners. So what is darkness? It's a covering that hides their problems. Okay, so it, it, they're trying to atone for their own shortcomings right they're trying to cover up their sins by pointing out other people's sins that somehow that that will take away the attention not just of others but even of their own selves from their right? sins it's a deflection right mm -hmm. now what is the christian principle that would counteract that and it's in that sentence itself So if we were going to give the antithesis of this sentence, what would it be? <clears throat> How about it? How about this? Instead of saying there's always plenty of men, there's one man who came into the world who was willing to submit himself to God's law for so that other people could be atoned for have atonement for their sins. Would that be the antithesis to this? Isn't this the opposite of the cross? Okay. <clears throat> And this is, the, this is the principle that I see in Jones' writing so many times. Not that he always followed it, but at least he presented it. Is that God is so different from us that he acts in a way that's different from how we act. So if we understand how God has acted toward the sinner, um, you know, we can, we can learn a lot. Now, he, he, I skipped another sentence here, but let's look at this one. The rights of a Christian do not include the prohibiting of other people from going contrary to his own religious belief or practice. His rights are not concerned by his religious belief. So Christians don't have a right to control others. There's a vast difference between being directed by the Lord and being under the direction of some man who claims to speak for the Lord. We prefer to be guided by the word of the Lord, interpreted by his spirit. So we can look at all around us these, the way that 
uh, religions have acted, the way that the state has acted. Now, when he talks here about religious right, he's talking about the right of religious freedom, to believe as one believes according to his own conscience. So religious right is the greatest boon that was ever given or that ever could be given to men. That is the truth, and being the truth in the nature of things, such a boon can come only, could come from God only. Religious right, as generally understood and as contemplated in these lines, is the right of every person to choose for himself in things religious, without constraint of any kind from any person or source, whatever. The freedom God has given to men, as is declared by the motto of the American Sentinel, in the words of the Lord Jesus, If any man hear my words, and believe not, I judge him not. The right is given by the Lord to men, and is thus recognized by the Lord in men. This is illustrated in the transaction in the Garden of Eden. The man was made in the image of God to glorify God, yet left perfectly free not to do so, if he so chose. And, or choose, and was left perfectly free to choose for himself whether he would or not. He was left as free to choose not to serve God as he was to serve him. So we can see that freedom comes from God. It's not something that um, man can grant us. Uh, no state can ever have any shadow of right by legislation or any other way to circumscribe the perfect freedom of every man to choose for himself whether he will regard or disregard any religious belief or right or custom or practice. And every man's right utterly to disregard everything of the kind is as complete as it is to regard it. No church has any shadow of ground for condemning any man or any number of men who disregard everything which that church holds sacred. Every person has perfect right to disregard all that any church or all churches together believe or practice. The professed Christian church or individual who condemns or criticizes or set at naught any person for disregarding any religious belief or right or custom denies the God of Christianity. Loyalty to religious right does not consist in asserting our own right to be religious or not religious at our own constrained, unconstrained choice, but in the unswerving recognition of the right of the other man to be religious or not religious at his own personal and unconstrained choice. This is so plain that it must be recognized at once by everyone. In the garden, God did not assert his own right to be religious for himself and other people too. That matter could take care of itself, but he did establish and recognize the right of man to believe or not believe him, just as the man himself might freely choose. This he did again in the divine motto of religious freedom. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. So Jones has this way of writing, and, and I suggest people read this. Um, now he's going to talk about these two principles, and, and you'll see why I'm reading this Jones article, not just because of the October 7th, 1897 date. Um, but it's going to relate to what we've been studying. Uh, there are two principles in the world by which human conduct is sought to be controlled, love and force. Love is the principle by which God works. The Bible tells us that God is love, and consequently, love is of God. Love is the highest principle of conduct that can exist. Force is a lower and altogether different principle. Force is employed by the enemies of God in seeking to make people act contrary to God's will. Love acts upon the individual from within. Force is applied to him from without. Love leads, force drives. And of course, we would all know this. Um, and we can see that when uh, the church loses the power of the gospel, it seeks the power of the state. And that when people tend to control others, it will usually because what they're trying to do is uh, for something that's actually contrary to God's will. That is, it's more likely that people will use force when they're teaching error than when they're teaching truth. 
That is, truth is actuated from this principle of love. Now, of course, we see people sometimes teaching true doctrines, at least in part, but using force to do so. But if you look further, you'll see that that doctrine is just a front to hide other types of errors. That is, truth can be mixed with error. So, you know, an example of this would be Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe in the state of the dead, similar to how Seventh-day Adventists do, in the sense that that's what the Bible teaches. But they practice, um, they use force or manipulation. Um, they don't allow people to examine things freely. People have to conform to the beliefs of the church. They can't just read literature from other churches. So even though they have some truth, we can see that there's lots of things that they do believe that are incorrect. Some of their views on prophecy, etc. And so they have to use force because if they allowed people to examine things for themselves, they wouldn't likely be Jehovah's Witnesses. Any comments on this so far? Well, I just see that since the church became recognized by the state and got its 5013C3 C3 status in the U.S., it's declined so much. You know, I mean, we should cut loose from the government as much as possible. Yeah, we can see and this. Once you start compromising with the state, uh, down you go. Yeah, we saw this also in, in our medical system. We also yep. saw educational institutions. Um, oh, yeah, as soon as you get credentialed, and Ellen White warned about that quite strenuously, and yet the church went ahead and did it, and yeah. you see the outcome. Because that, that becomes a friendship of the world. It, we're aligning ourselves with those that don't believe in God, and don't believe in the principles uh, that we believe in. So, so that was a very dangerous thing to do, and it and it's been, yeah, a, a problem with the Seventh Day Adventist Church. The Seventh Day Adventist Church, in a sense, has has modeled itself after the United States. It has its own medical institutions. It has its own uh, sort of government. It has its educational institutions, um, and and these have not, in the long run, benefited the church in the way that they've been done. So uh, I remember when um, uh, I think I only had two children at the time, but uh, I might have had Micah. Um, my kids were still not yet school age, but uh, the church that I was going to, because uh, I'd been an Adventist for a few years, um, they were sort of courting us as far as having put, putting our children in uh, the church school. They wanted us to put our children in, in um, Adventist schools. And, of course, I, I was just totally taken aback by that. I said, you know, my kids are not going to be going to a, a Christian school of any kind. Uh, they're going to be homeschooled uh, because I believe that these schools don't represent Christ. Um, I'm not going to have my children associating with a bunch of unconverted children. And... And I don't think that that was initially, uh, Adventist schools didn't really begin this work of educating children uh, from a young age. Uh, Adventist schools were supposed to be for older children, uh, you know, for, you know, children that are basically, um, you know, becoming adults. College. But anyway, yeah, well, high school maybe and, and college. But of course, the church likes to control. And, uh, Anyway, in bringing this up, the principle of education, um, the one thing that we see is that I wasn't going to put my children in a school that was connected to the state. And the Adventist schools here in Alberta have to teach uh, the curriculum that's given by the Alberta government, which is not an Adventist curriculum. So lots of reasons why I wouldn't put my children in a public school or in an Adventist school. 
but anyway, um, the other thing that I did with this date is I looked up this. Now, <clears throat> this was quite interesting. So I looked up this date, October 7th, 1897. So I found that E.T. Jones article and I read it. Um, and here we have something that's antithetical uh, to what Jones has written. And it says 1897, the year that defined American journalism. And what they're, I'm not going to go through and read much of this, but the basic idea is that, um, well, we'll find it here, just a good summary of this is this, on Amazon they have the book here. Um, and here's what they say about it. It's probably from the sleeve or something, uh, or maybe the, the forward, who knows. But anyway, the year that defined American journalism explores the succession of remarkable and decisive movements or moments in American journalism during 1897, a year of significant transition that helped redefine the profession and shape of its modern contours. This defining year featured a momentous clash of paradigms, pitting the activism, activism of William Randolph Hearst's participatory journalism of action against the detached, fact-based antithesis of activist journalism, as represented by Adolf Ox in the New York Times, and an eccentric experiment in literary, literary journalism uh, pursued by Lincoln Steffers in the New York Commercial Advertiser. Resolution of the three-sided clash of paradigms would take and result ultimately in the ascendancy of the Times counter-activist model, which remains the defining standard for mainstream American journalism. The year that defined American journal journalism introduces the year, year study methodology to mass communications research and enriches our understanding of the pivotal moment in media history. Now, I don't know if that's exactly what I get got from uh, this here, but they, this is a question and answer to the author of the book, so frequently asked questions. Um, so he says here, so the book has relevance to contemporary journalism. Absolutely. It is not only a book about the past, rather it demonstrates how the past can be useful and even reassuring to today's journalists in confronting the pressures and challenges of a media landscape very much in flux. In many ways, the parallels of 1897 are striking. Um, so it's going to talk about new technologies and different things like that. Uh, but um, I'm trying to find this part that I saw before. OK, so this clash of paradigms. Um, let me see, that wasn't the part here. No, some of this is kind of not really interesting okay i think it's going to be okay here it is what was the single most dramatic event in journalism in 1897 and that had to be the cisneros jailbreak in havana organized by hearst new york journal i alluded to this case earlier it was truly an amazing episode, but one that has been largely forgotten. When it is remembered, the Cisneros jailbreak is usually dismissed as a hoax or a put-up job in which well-placed bribes made the dramatic escape possible. My research indicates otherwise. It was not a hoax. It was not a put-up job. Rather, the Cisneros jailbreak was the successful result of an intricate plot in which clandestine Cuban operatives and the U.S. diplomatic personnel filled vital roles, roles that remained obscure for more than a hundred years. Evangelina Cisneros was jailed for conspiring against the Spanish military, which was then trying to put down a rebellion across much of Cuba. She was accused of conspiracy to commit murder and was kept in jail for more than a year without trial. Hearst and his journal learned of the young woman's plight and mounted a noisy petition drive calling on Spain to set her free. The journal characterized her as a Cuban patriot, guilty 
only of having in her veins the best blood in Cuba. The journal, was all, the journal also described her jailing as typical of Spain's cruel treatment of Cuban women. In any event, thousands of American women signed petitions, some of them quite prominent, such as Julia Ward Howe and the mother of President McKinley. But the journal's petition drive failed. Spain refused to budge. So Hearst decided to rescue her and sent a Washington-based reporter named Carl Decker to Cuba with orders to do so. Decker was nominally the journal's correspondent in Havana. He was also secretly at work on plans for the jailbreak. He tapped into a clandestine network that smuggled arms and medicine into Cuba and on occasion smuggled people off the island. U.S. diplomatic personnel also gave quiet support to the jailbreak, which took place in the wee hours of October 7th, 1897. So um, the idea is that this case here, uh, it disclosed its role in organizing the jailbreak and rescue, declaring uh, the case epical and a supreme achievement of the journalism of action. So, so what are we talking about here, this journalism of action, this participatory activism of the media? How does that reflect upon what we see happening in the world today? Rather than reporting the news, they're making the news. Yeah, they're making the news. They're manipulating. They don't care about facts. Right? They're more interested in making a story than understanding the story. Yeah, and they have an agenda. And that agenda would be that agenda that we see talked about in A.T. Jones that, that often we see is happening by the church and the state. But we can see that if we look at the most powerful force in the world today, it would have to be the media. And the media is not presenting the facts it's presenting a narrative. And it doesn't matter whether it's Fox News or CNN or some other media outlet. We cannot be, all of them are, are, um, we have a slant or a bias. To yeah, well, they're journalism of action, right? They are seeking to bring about their view of the world, correct? Yes. Yeah. The, the media is politicized. I mean, there might be some media that isn't, but it would be pretty insignificant in what we get in the media. And we see this on every, on every front. And so, when it comes to the news, what news are we interested in? Only the good news of the gospel. So if you yeah. have yeah. So you have the Nashville World Centennial Fair going on then as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in eighteen ninety seven, uh you have the Nashville World's Fair, right? Is that what it is? The Centennial Fair. Centennial. It's the Nashville Centennial Fair? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that's where we're going to have um, uh, the Parthenon, right? Yeah, so October 7th would be the 160th day of the fair. And I'll run for another 24 days then. Okay. Ends of 31st of October. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I knew it was, but um, I didn't. I didn't do any looking up on the dates of it. Uh, I just knew that. Uh, yeah. So we're going to have. So it's the hundred and sixtieth day, and it's going to go then for a um, hundred and eighty-four days. Yes. And and that would be a cardinal count or an ordinal count. When does the fair start? Um, July 
you have the date for when it starts. Uh, May 1st and ends on 31st of October. Okay, so it's going to be on May Day? <laughs> yes. Okay, so that's going to be the 160th day, so that's 159 days from the start if we do a cardinal count. And then... And then we go, uh, yeah, so altogether it's 183 days. Um, what's the significance of 183 days? Is it half a year? Yeah, so it's a half a uh, year, yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Um, hmm. Okay. So, so interesting point there. Now, um, we get back to, to the everlasting gospel. So let's go to Revelation 14. The gospel is what? What does that word gospel mean? Revelation 14, mm -hmm. verse 6. Okay, the gospel means good news, right? A good message, right? Um, in, in the English word, um, you know, God spell. Um, so something that comes from God, a message from God, the good news. And it's the everlasting gospel. And this is the message that is given by these three angels. But do angels give the message? People do. People do. Right? <clears throat> the message is. We're inspired by them. They can yeah. inspire and, and 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 strengthen and protect us. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we we understand the angels here being symbolic, not not literal. There isn't going to be angels yelling these these words, proclaiming these gospels. It's it's God's people. And and we know that it's a three step testing prophetic message, and we know also Revelation eighteen is a repetition of the second angel's message that joins the third angel and empowers it. And that represents our history. It's the history of the Sunday law. And, and that Sunday law is still future. Um, it's not going to happen in 2022 because this work has not been accomplished yet. Unless this work could be accomplished in, in, a few short months, um, which I don't see that happening. We also have all of these contrary voices that um, this message is in some ways following. That is, um, the people in our movement are listening to all these other voices, these other ministers, thinking that what they're hearing is the gospel. But how do we know that what's being presented by all of these myriad of voices is not the gospel. It doesn't follow the spirit of prophecy or the Bible. Okay. Can somebody be proclaiming the third angel's message without having experienced the first and second angel's messages? No. If they reject this message, they can't have they can't be proclaiming the gospel. Even if, even if some of what they're saying is true, it can't be the gospel. This movement was raised up to proclaim the first and second angel's message, to prepare Seventh-day Adventists for the Sunday law. And this is something that we have to take very seriously. This is hey, what this, these studies have been about. Hey, Brother Theodore. Yeah. Can I read a quote about the angels being people? Yep. Go ahead. This, this is um, from Selected Messages, page 387. It says, the angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming the world 
to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one by no one hears the voice of angel of these angels, for they are a symbol uh, to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universal uni, universe of heaven. Men and women enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaiming the three angels, the third angel, the third met. The third message in their order. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, this is the last study that I wanted to do on 2030, the World Economic Forum. And um, I'm just going to do the new share here. So here we have the three angels' messages, the messages of the three angels. Um, and I want your input on this. So my view is, or my suggestion, is that we should uh, begin a study starting on uh, next Friday on the three angels' messages, uh, going over the writings of the spirit of prophecy, especially the early ones, dealing with that history. Um, I don't know how long a series it would be. Uh, but examining clearly the first, second, and third angels' messages. And we've done this somewhat indirectly in lots of our other studies. All right, so we're obviously touching on the lines. When we study the lines, we're studying the first, second, and third angels' messages. Uh, but what do people think about the idea of studying what Ellen White says about these messages? Um, and, and the book that we would use as sort of a textbook is going to be the third angels' messages source book. Now I know I've kind of done this before, but this would be a, a little bit different. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, I'm okay with that. Okay. Uh, I think it's a really good idea. I just find it so What's that, Angela? You, your mic went mute. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, that the mainstream church has has the Vatican flag flying at their GCS and is, has become so ac ecumenical. And yet they're saying, we're preaching the third angel's message. Like, where are you preaching it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, thanks. Good choice. Hey, yeah. Brother Theodore, I got a, is it, is it resource book? Is it like the, one they got where it's um they have all three angels messages quotes from Alan White compilation. Well, it's not it 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 doesn't so much have that. It does have um uh, some of that. So we'd be using this sort of it, it's more from Millerite history of uh, that book, but it does have Ellen White's summaries of those from uh, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy uh, volumes. Um, dealing with that, so I think it's Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, where she deals with the first angel's message, the second, the third, the midnight cry, and, and that. So so I would use that book. I would use some other material, too. But, yeah, it's not a complete compilation on everything that Ellen White says about the three, the three angels' messages. But, anyway, that's one of the books. So I'll, when I send out an email uh, for next week's studies, I'll include – some some documentation there that, that's what i'd like to do on friday friday evenings and then on sabbath afternoons um i know I, I sort of did something similar to this it was a shorter series and it was in response to um some people in the canadian group who were concerned that we weren't teaching uh, the three angels messages and so we did a study on that but they didn't actually uh, watch this so um, uh, maybe um something for later on uh, i'd be happy just yeah to study these three angels is always good to go over it again yeah. um but uh, the 1888 history the message there 
would be good to study maybe sometime afterwards? Well, this would be part of it, part of the study. So when we get to the third angel's message, we deal with the 1888 history. Yes, that would be good. Yeah. And heard that. Yeah, because I think that's um, extremely important. Now, I mean, there's a lot of material for the 1888 history, um, which I've pretty much read everything in the past, a long time ago. Um, 1888 materials and uh, all Jones and Wagner's books. But, um, you know, to try to sort of bring out what that teaching was and how it's been distorted uh, by various movements within the church and by the church itself. So that history, uh, for many Adventists, what they have is kind of a, um, uh, a colored history. You know, it's been shaded with very different shades of, uh, depending on which group you're in, of how you see it, how you see what the message of 1888 was and what happened there. Uh, but when you look at the documentation itself, it's actually quite clear and simple. It's not as um, shrouded in mystery as somebody like Froome might try to paint it. Okay, so thanks everyone for your participation. And uh, we're going to close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, again, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the time that we have had to study this topic. We know, Lord, that there's many loose threads that still uh, need our attention. And we pray that you can help us in our personal study to look into these things. Thank you for... Uh, the truths in your word, for the way that you have guided uh, these studies and that you continue to guide our morning studies and, and, and the presentations of Dwight. And we just pray that each person can continue um, to look into these things on their own. Help us to truly love one another and to treat others as Christ has treated us. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.